Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Keith. Hi, Keith. By the grace of a loving God, Alcoholics Anonymous, rooms full of people like you, and a little effort on my own. I haven't had to take a drink or do any dope since May the 11th, 1976, and for that I'm especially grateful. <laughs> Hold that money, will you, Hoss? I might be tempted. <laughs> Got to get rid of the money and shoot that light out up there. <laughs> It's really a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be anywhere, but to be able to participate in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is certainly a privilege and an honor. It's a special privilege to be uh, here this weekend. I could probably stand here for 45, 50 minutes and explain the steps and how they worked in my life, and they'd just be words, because what you do speaks so loud I can't hear a word you say. So the main proof of what those steps have done in my life sits within this room. Dr. Paul saw me on my very first day. He was uh, in charge of a detox in May of 1976. He and a, another doctor by the name of Dr. Zuska had started a, a day, uh, as for they were country club type of deals, it was shake and bake. And, uh, <laughs> and I got drug over there into that thing by a little man by the name of Jack Callahan, who's still in my life. I talk to him every Tuesday, a beautiful little man. He drug me over there and put me in that old detox. And Dr. Paul was uh, my doctor. He saw me on my very first sober day. I didn't see him, but he saw me. <laughs> and uh, it is a privilege to have somebody who saw you when you were new. If you've been here a while. And so, uh, and Max, they took me to my very first outside AA meeting out of that detox. He, he had uh, faith and trust in a power greater than himself, and he put me and another goof in a car and took us to an outside meeting and introduced me to my home group. My home group is a dog on a roof group. It's 33, that meeting is 33 years old. And uh, the, the founder of that meeting is a guy by the name of Ivan Miller. Ivan Miller has passed on to the big meeting in the sky, a beautiful little man, just a common little man who started that meeting in the barn in the backyard because his wife kicked him out of the house when he was drunk and he moved into the barn on the back uh, lot and him and his dogs and had holes in the roof so he put a ladder up on the roof going to fix a hole in that roof and he was drinking and never got around to it but the dogs got up on the roof and they run around up on the roof and... Uh, he eventually sobered up, and she let him back in the house, so he started a meeting out in that barn on the back lot. And the dogs would get up on the roof, and they'd bring newcomers over there, and they'd run up and around on that roof, and the newcomers thought that was their higher power. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Ivan Miller passed that legacy on to me. Uh, before he died, he made me make a commitment to him to carry the legacy. That meeting is founded on strong sponsorship, the steps of the program, and uh, a loving God. And that meeting and the legacy of those old-timers goes on today. I come from that kind of a foundation. Uh, as far as the family is concerned, my father's sitting here. He's a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, sitting next to my wife. Sue and I have been together 34 years. And uh, you bet. I loved it when Paul said, you know, the people have pain of these divorces. They ought to have to go through 34 or 50 years of this stuff. Well, <laughs> you ought to get some kind of a medal for that. But I don't get to whine about that in my home group. And, uh, <clears throat> but I'm truly blessed. I, I, uh, I truly am. I love my wife because she's never resented the method of my recovery. She's never been one day since I come to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that she'd wished I'd been anywhere else other than a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need that kind of support, certainly. And I got a daughter, a a beautiful young lady who's a very big part of our family and a big part of our life. And truly, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous is that the families can come back together. I know that a lot of them don't, and that's why I always want to show some 
I guess, debt of gratitude that my family stayed together, came together, and has stayed together within the confines of the program of AA, Al-Anon, and Alateen growing up through that. And we are very fortunate to do that. We're very fortunate. Not all of them uh, are willing with that kind of willingness. But I do believe that the willingness that our family had to work this program in our life is in direct proportion to the amount of pain that we went through. And uh, we went through a lot of pain in order to get here. So I really don't need to explain to you the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. As Cleve said, we're friends. They were, I suppose if there's heroes, I don't know that I necessarily like that word, but there's people who are examples, good examples in the whole confines of their life. And this rally here is an example of that. And the people that put it on and, and, and the speakers and the, I especially like to go to a conference where you get substitutes. I really like that because there ain't nothing I'd like to see better outside of a newcomer get well but a new speaker get up here and talk for their very first or nearly first time. I'd like some time to get all the circuit speakers and Alcoholics Anonymous together and have them speak at a conference and have them all tell the truth. <laughs> It'd sell all the tapes because they'd buy them. <laughs> but I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful to see new people come and share. There's a lot of good people in Alcoholics Anonymous that have good stories to tell and to share it with you. And I love to see that in, when people get an opportunity to, to come without the benefit of pre preparation and all that kind of psychobabble that sometimes we think we got to do in order to entertain you or you know, whatever it is that we that we make ourselves think we're supposed to do. I want to commend you because the people that show up on Sunday morning are the diehards. Because there ain't going to be no dance when this meeting's over. <laughs> you got to want it real bad or else you got no place to go. I want to point out something that's a miracle, an absolute miracle, sitting on this side on the rogues gallery over here. There happens to be a plumber, a brick mason, and a mechanic. <laughs> we're not professionals in any sense of the word, other than we are we're professional and it's screwing our lives up. But we dressed up pretty good for a plumber and a bricklayer and a mechanic. <laughs> Our mamas dressed us real good this morning. <laughs> I'm a real alcoholic. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous describes a real alcoholic. I'm extremely grateful that definition is in there because it fits me to a T. There are a lot of other definitions of moderate drinker, heavy drinker, and the definition of a real alcoholic is completely and totally my story. Someone who's insanely drunk most of the time. A real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I love that part. I love to change right before your very eyes. <laughs> I had that down pat. I I can't really explain to you my childhood. I don't remember it much. I was so into self. But I was in, my dad and I were in the restaurant yesterday. June Christensen come in there. I don't know if any of you know her. I should have you stand up because she knows the real truth. <clears throat> but she said she had an old man from Beaver, Oklahoma, which is where I come from, grew up in. I wasn't born in Oklahoma because they didn't have a place to be, you know, if you wanted to go to the hospital. I had to go across the line into Texas. I was born in Perryton, Texas, and then taken back to Oklahoma. So I'm really an Oki at heart. And uh, June came in the restaurant, and she was telling us that there was a man that run a hardware store up in Beaver, Oklahoma, for years and years, had been in her home. And uh, she was telling him, said, I know a man from Beaver, Oklahoma. His name's Keith Drum. And this old timer said, uh, well, I know him. He's a very distinguished gentleman. He's a lawyer up there. And she said, no. I don't think that's the one I'm talking about. But I'm talking about his son. That old timer said, that was the meanest little kid I ever seen in my life. But I knew that kid from that tall, and he was the meanest little kid I ever seen. And I didn't realize that. I just thought I was having fun. And uh, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a certain amount of uh, difficulties. Uh, I looked for all the differences. I looked for all the things that made me stand away from Alcoholics Anonymous, and consequently, I didn't, uh, I didn't stay sober when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And I've come to understand, you know, when I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous May 11, 1976, I looked for the similarities. And one of the, one of the most difficult, uh, comparisons that I made was because when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I heard people, uh, you heard it here all weekend. People talk about their inadequacies and their fears and, and their, their pimples and their, and all that. And I had all that. But, you know, I've come to understand that fear is an unbelievable emotion. And people react to fear in different ways. Fear is a wish. And I lived with fear. I knew fear. I was a scared little boy that grew up to be a scared little boy. Fear was an emotion that turned into anger and adrenaline. You know, it's an amazing thing. That emotion affects different people in different ways. Fear to some people will demobilize them and they'll hunker down in a corner like a mule and take a stick of dynamite to blow them out. And yet fear to other people is an adrenaline. And so fear to me was a, an accelerator, an adrenaline rush. And the excitement behind that, I drove right through those inadequacies. I had a terrible time identifying with those inadequacies because I wasn't one of those people that stood against the wall and waited for somebody to come along and give me a drink so I could come out of my shell and have fun. I brought the band, man. I started the party, and when the thing was over, I gathered up whoever was too stupid to go home or didn't have one, came with me, and we partied on. I never really, I was always out front. My biggest problem was when I got ahead of the charge on occasion, the other people would turn to the right or the left, and it would be lonely out there. <laughs> I, uh, at a very early age in my life, uh, uh, I had a nervous uh, stomach and I had a, I guess, a hyperactive kid and my uncle was a doctor. I guess he was kind of an uncle. And, uh, and my grandma got me hooked up with him and they started giving me amphetamines at an early age because amphetamines are supposed to calm you down. I, I, to this day, I don't understand why anybody with that kind of education would give somebody has, who has an abundance of energy speed. <laughs> it really don't slow you down, just speeds you up so you look like you're in neutral. You know? <laughs> and uh, I had an acquired taste immediately for that because it's like going 190 miles an hour with your feet nailed to the floor, you know? <laughs> You could see color and hear sound, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, any way you looked at it, it just, bam, and uh, I liked it, and uh, that coupled with a little alcohol just set, it just lit the flame, and I took off, and uh, and I, I let her rip from a get-go, and I got in a lot of trouble. I have, my father's a lawyer, I have been always forever grateful my daddy went to law school. <laughs> Never had no resentment on that. <laughs> Kept him on retainer for years. <laughs> Until he got so drunk he couldn't show up for my court case. <laughs> Anything I can't stand when I'm drunk is a drunken lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just I just took off. I let her rip. I, I ended up, my grandma said, don't take any more effort to marry a rich girl than it does a poor girl. And I took everything my grandma said to heart. And my first wife was very, from a very, very wealthy family. That marriage lasted a very short time because her father called me in and he said, I'm a very wealthy man. And I said, I have observed that. <laughs> <laughs> I may be sick, but I ain't stupid. <laughs> and... Uh, he said, I have all this money because I don't make bad investments, and you're a bad investment. <laughs> <laughs> and they offered me a certain amount to get out of their life, and at that time he knew what my price was, and I took it and left. short time later, I'd spent all that money and recognized I sold out too cheap. <laughs> I made a firm decision I'd never sell out that cheap again if I were ever asked. I have never been asked since that time, <laughs> but I do know my price today. <clears throat> And I took off on a rip roaring life, and I, I was going to have fun and enjoy things. And I, I had a little run of bad luck down in South Texas, and heat got on, and and uh, I went back up in the Panhandle. I 
Texas Oklahoma Panhandle to rest. He's got to go home and rest. If you're busy out there, that's all home is for. Is you got to go home to rest. A, you go back to the nest. And I went back to the nest, and I, I had my two very best friends, Oily and Goose, pick me up in Amarillo. I got off the train over in Amarillo. I'd call them when I got out of jail down there in South Texas, and Oily and Goose picked me up one of them pick 'em up trucks with shotgun rifle hanging in the back window, and had some white lightning, fruit jar, and some three-two beer. And I did my first fifth step. And I rode 120 miles from Amarillo, Texas, out to the Panhandle, down on Wolf Creek, Saturday afternoon, as having one of them good old boy dances down on Wolf Creek. And I told Oil and Goose, I gotta quit hanging around with you guys. Every time I hang around with you guys, I get in trouble. They said, yeah, yeah, you do. I said, I gotta stay out of them honky tonks, gotta stay out of them honky tonk bars. I get in them honky tonks, I get in trouble every time. And they said, yeah. Yeah, you do. I said, I gotta stay away from them sick women. Man, I get with them sick women, I get in trouble every time. You can line ten women up against that wall and I get the sickest one out of the bunch every time. And they said, yeah, you do. <laughs> we drank that moonshine and three, two beer and that'll make you somebody. And we pulled up in front of that Wolf Creek dance and the band was taking a little intermission, got there about midnight. And I went in, I wanted everybody to know I was home, so I rolled a Coke bottle down against the band, the stage like this in the back of the room, and I said, let the meanest sucker in the house bring that back to me. <laughs> and it looked like a stampede coming my direction. <laughs> everybody was glad to see me. <laughs> and I punched the first guy who was stupid enough to lead the charge, and... Uh, I took off running because it looked to me like it's getting out of hand. <laughs> and I zipped in the woman's restroom because I'd spotted that on the way in. And there was a lady standing there. I said, tell me when the fight was over. And I run in and hid. I found out later she finished the fight. <laughs> she was handy and I was desperate. She said, come out now, cowboy. So I asked her to dance and I'm a quick study, one quick dance. I found out she had a job, a car, a place to stay, a driver's license, had everything I needed. <laughs> we immediately fell in sick. That's where the rocks in my head fit the holes in hers. <laughs> I gave her the old one-two. I said, stick with me, baby, and I'll take you places you've never been before. <laughs> I did, too. Most of them she didn't want to go, but heck, I took her anyway, you know. We had a blast. Just had a blast. Just it was just it was just having a you know it was just a constant party, and you just heal up and start over again. And uh, her mama had uh, started partying, and they had a house and up there in Perryton, Texas, and panhandling. We just partied all the time. It was just crazy, crazy. And uh, you know we, we you know sick attracts sick, and uh, I'm physically violent kind of a person. Uh, I won't debate with anybody whether or not verbal abuse is worse than physical abuse. I will tell you that I was talking to you when I was beating the heck out of you. I give it my best shot. <clears throat> but I've always been physical. People would say, I've heard alcoholics tell me, say, well, I never hit a woman. I said, by golly, you never lived with Sue. <laughs> that was self-defense. I liked her because she could protect my back, but when she turned on me, oh, <laughs> claw and scratch and kick, and just, oh, man, I mean, we just, you know, I mean, that's the only way we create a little passion in our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we we hung in there and uh, finally got married because she said she's pregnant and I was the father. I don't remember that. I must have been crossing over the invisible line when that <laughs> I was making the journey. I didn't know anything about being a husband or a father or any of them kind of things. I had no idea how to do that, and I didn't know where the book was to read up on it. I really didn't care. And, uh, you know, I went to school from the time I started the first grade until I quit going to school for 21 years. I went to school. I'm living proof. You can go to school for 21 years and not learn a darn thing. Because <laughs> school was not... My grandpappy told me there isn't anything easier than going to school, but there's nothing harder than learning. And he was right. I remember one time, 
Somebody asked my dad what I was taking. What's he majoring in? And I think my dad said, I think he's just switched majors to electronics. He's going to learn how to wire home for money. (laughs) (laughs) I love the deal, man. And you go around these schools, that's where the deal is, man. It's where the deal is. I like the deal. Deal me in 50 cents or 50 million. I don't care. I want the deal. And I've always been in the deal. And I ended up... uh, with his wife and kid, and I didn't geographic my family around much. I found a place, put them down, and then I just ran and did my deal. And after a period of time, it's necessary for me to leave Texas. Uh, that'll happen to you. In AA, we call them tip trips geographics, but when I left, it was called unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. <laughs> time to move on. We loaded everything up in an old station wagon trailer. We had a 120-pound German Shepherd dog. We had a cat that walked and scratched all the time, and we had a kid, and we loaded it all up and took off for California because a guy named Lion Shorty offered me a job on a ranch 40 miles west of Long Beach, and I didn't have sense enough to know that was ocean. (laughs) I could tell you a lot of things, but we were just leaving in the dark of the night to just escape, and it took us a long time to make a short trip, but that's the way alcoholics are, and... uh, I would get lost, and Sue would say, why don't you pull in there and ask somebody where we are? And I said, I wouldn't even think of doing that. Then they'd know I'm lost. <laughs> and so I just, we just finally got there, and I got a hold of a drunken uncle, and he helped me find a place to live, found a house just right for me, wherever I go, take me, and I'm the first one to get there, and there I am. And whenever I got there, there they were, the people that I was going to get away from, they moved with me. The only difference was there was some hippies lived next door to me. I'd never seen no hippies. They're strange. <laughs> but I'd left Oily and Goose back home, and I needed some new friends. And so there was a dude over there named Doc and another named Professor. <laughs> I figured anybody by the name of Doc and Professor are bound to have all the answers to my question. <laughs> they were doing a little chemistry over there, better living through chemistry. Never seen that. They were dropping LSD, taking their clothes off, and laying in the front yard watching the sun come up and go down, <laughs> wandering around. <laughs> they, they gave me a hit of acid, and I went to see 2001, man. And, <laughs> then I could see sound and hear color. <laughs> But I was afraid of that, see? I was afraid of that stuff. I was afraid it might screw up my brain cells. <laughs> now you know I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> but I, uh, I set up a little happy homemaking there and uh, took off to do my thing because I'm a traveling man. I hit the road and away I went, and I, I would go off and do my deal, and, and uh, I geographically got worked around the oil fields. I loved the oil business, and I was in the oil business and roaring and tearing from Louisiana to Alaska. And to, you know, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many miles it was from Los Angeles to Anchorage, Alaska, but I could tell you how many fifths of whiskey it took to get there. And I was working in them old rigs, and uh, I loved the oil business. You know, big deals and big wheels, and I loved it. And we covered for each other and backed each other up. I was working on a rig in Alaska up on the North Slope, and I working Derrick's, and I've been up there, I run out of chewing tobacco. You don't run out of chewing tobacco. That's almost as bad as running out of whiskey. And I come down off them blocks, and flame was leaving. I said, I got to go get my coat. And old pusher said, where is your coat? And I said, Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> and that's the way we were, and I just took off, and uh, eventually I'd have to come home and rest, and I always like to bring my friends with me. You know, they're the guys that don't want to go home and fight their old lady, so they come watch me fight with mine, you know. <laughs> come on, you know. And we'd come roaring in, and uh, Sue would always meet me at the doors like her mouth was attached to the doorknob, you know. And, <laughs> Give me the what fors. And had this butcher knife waving around all the time. <laughs> My friend would say, get her. I said, heck, you get her. She's packing a big knife there. <laughs> We loved each other, so I'll tell you the most spiritual thing. I know there has to be a God because for almost 13 years, any time I slept in that bed with that woman, she had that knife either between the mattress with a handle sticking out 
or under the pillow. And I slept with a loaded 45 round and chamber safety off on my nightstand. And those weapons were not to protect us from people outside the house. <laughs> One time she said, we've never been on a vacation, need a vacation. And I had some of my good old buddies, and they were going off on a big run up into little town Nevada to wild burrow races. And uh, and uh, so we had a camper, and me and my bros, we got together, and we all go up there in this place, you know. And uh, back then, it was fashionable for the women to wear wigs, you know, fall. Had a big wig, you know, with a beehive thing, and then a fall down the back. So we got one of them, paid about $350 on the installment plan. And she put that wig on, see, and got in the camper and got the kid and the dog and the cat in there. And away we went. And me and my brothers, we went up there and we camped out in the deal. Been there about 10 days on a run and drunk. And Sue was in there cooking for all of us in this camper and everything else. And it's hot. Hot. Must have been 115 at night up there. And the, t- the cab over camper was, you know, at a little old short place. So she'd sleep up there and I'd lay down her and the kid sleep up there. And I'd lay down there by the door and I'd put my old hog leg down there by the deal because wild animals had come into camp at night. They told us that them animals come in and get the garbage. You got to be careful. They come in in the middle of the night. After about the tenth day, Sue's wig she hadn't had it off, and it, in the middle of the night, it turned around. <laughs> and she woke up and had wigs in front of her, and she thought one of them wild animals had come in there and got on her. She raised up, hit the top of the camper, and screamed and grabbed that wig and throwed it out the back door of that camper. I shot four holes in that $350 wig. I had that baby popping. <laughs> She's so glad that I killed that thing. <laughs> I mean, that, that was vacation. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while before she wanted to go again, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but uh, I eventually found myself standing in front of the judge, and the judge is talking to me about me, and he's got the right guy, and he was talking to me about doing something I didn't really remember doing. And uh, he knew more about what I'd been doing than I knew, and uh, through a course of uh, action and a series of events there, I had... Some parole, I had a parole, I had some kind of a court action in one court. You know, you get to skipping them deals around in different courts so you don't have a court date in the same time in the same city and all that stuff. And they caught up with me and they talked to me about having to do a little time. And through the system, then they were starting to talk about Alcoholics Anonymous in the court system. And uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know anything about AA. You know, I never heard of it. And... Uh, I come from a long line of drunks, and I never knew anybody in my family ever. I'd never heard of it before. And my parole officer at the time talked to me about going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't, I never was, you know, if I wasn't afraid of something, I had no apprehension of it. And so when they talked to me about going to Alcoholics Anonymous, well, I'm not sure. Because they were talking to me about doing some time, and I was a little afraid of that. And so I, uh, I opted to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and my parole officer and the judge set the deal up, and they put me together with this old man, Ivan Miller, who was working with the court system, and who was the founder of my home group, and uh, not knowing that then. And Ivan hooked up with me, came over to the courthouse, and got me, and took me home, and Ivan had that meeting over at his house, and he never told me about that meeting. He knew about me. He could tell that I was not going to stay sober, and so he didn't invite me to his home group. He said, there's plenty of AA meetings. And uh, you'll find them. And he took me over to the, there was a meeting over in the church where all the goody two-shoes went and high rolling drunks, high bottom drunks. He took me over there. He thought I'd probably give them a thrill. And <laughs> <coughs> took me home, laid me down, and I, I laid on the couch. I had had a little altercation with somebody with a crescent wrench who had hit me upside the head and almost took my ear off. So I had a turban wrapped around my head, and I just got kicked out of jail in court. And Ivan took me over there, laid down on the couch. The suit had been... We'd had a big fight the day or so before that, and she'd gone to see a lawyer, and they suggested I go to AA. So she'd come home and suggest I go to AA, and I wanted her to think it was her idea. So I didn't tell her about Ivan, and I, I said, yeah, I think it's about time to try something like that. <laughs> I'd already been sprinkled and dipped and baptized so many times that I was about to get waterlogged to look like a prune they'd prayed on me so many times. 
And so I, I uh, said, well, there's a meeting over here, ways, uh, and church starts at 8.30, it's over at 10. And uh, so she said the deal, and she come over and stuck that butcher knife in my face and said, we're going to AA. And the cops had taken all my guns away, so I couldn't defend myself. So I got up and got in the car, and we drove over to the church, big AA sign out front. And I, sheesh, my friends see me. Out here, they're going to know I was sunk to the bottom for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm out there. I'm driving my car up and down in front of people's yards, but I'm about to go in an AA meeting. I don't want anybody to know I've sunk that low. You know, I got my motorcycle stuck in the front of my house. I rode it on a wheelie right up into the front of my house and left it there, stuck in the board. But I don't want anybody to see me going to AA. Because them are sick people over there. And I go in there because she said, get in and don't come out till it's over. And I tell you what, I may not have been an alcoholic at that point in my life, but I wasn't stupid. And when that woman, that butcher and I said, get in that house in there, whatever that deal is. And when you got a crazy woman circling the perimeter with a 12 inch butcher and I, you'll stay in. I went to that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wasn't an alcoholic, and if you're not really an alcoholic, you're not really, really an alcoholic. And I wasn't an alcoholic, and as a result of that effort, I've come to understand there's two kinds of people come to alcoholics, and basically, there's the people who come here to change the consequences in their life, and there's people who come here to change their life. If you come to change the consequences, and the consequences only, you don't even have to quit drinking. The consequences will change. You just won't stay sober. And I came to change the consequences. I did not come to change my life whatsoever. I didn't even know that. I come to get the heat off. And I went to one meeting a week for four months. Most miserable time of my entire life. Didn't do nothing. I said, dry as a fire hazard. <laughs> <coughs> went to that meeting, went home, didn't ask, didn't talk about nothing, didn't say nothing. I'd wait, go back to that meeting. I went to one meeting a week for four months. And then I did another little inventory. I looked around, my old dog's laying next to me, I pat him on the head, the cat's in my lap purring, the kid's over here, pat the kid on the head, she's in the kitchen, I'm back in the big bedroom, parole officer cut the deal. And I thought to myself, Self, you have prematurely gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. I know I'll be there someday, but I'll be old. And nothing else will be left to do. And I had established a little trust, and she let me go by myself, and I... Drove right by that AA meeting, and I made a decision. I made a decision to have a drink. And I didn't go to that AA meeting, and I got struck drunk immediately. Whoa! And my life changed. Because it never gets better. It always gets worse. And when it gets worse, it gets worser. And I don't remember anything anybody said in that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in that four months except one thing. And if you're new, relatively new, I'm going to pass it on to you. I remember one old boy one night said, we will not guarantee you after tonight that you have had your last drink, but we will guarantee you that after tonight, you'll never enjoy another one. <laughs> oh, ain't nothing worse than having a head full of AA and a belly full of booze. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Drives you crazy. You just know you're a loser. You don't fit out there. You don't fit over there. You know they're over there. And you know you don't belong. And you're just sinking. You're screeching down the wall of life. And uh, it got worse. The violence got worse. The insanity got worse. My book tells me I'm going to share with you what it used to be like, what happened, what it's like today in a general way. And thank God it's in a general way. And I come to understand that the, what happened is a vitally important thing. It's a turning point. It is a point in my life, a reference point. It is a foundation, a beginning, a spiritual experience all in one. Mine didn't happen overnight. I've only grown through spiritual experiences and a flash of lightning, but over a course of approximately four years, uh, my life got so bad that I couldn't stand me anymore. I had been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous many times during that period of time. I had sobered up many times during that period of time, gone to Alcoholics Anonymous, rededicated myself, stood up as a newcomer, slipped, 
in and out, in and out. And you know that book, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, talks about something very, very, very vitally important to me. My kind of an alcoholic. I don't know about you, but my kind of an alcoholic. He describes, <clears throat> describes in a story a man who sobered up. And he says, as soon as I could think, I immediately got a, drunk again without even the slightest thought of the consequences. And that is a very important thing for my kind of an alcoholic because physical sobriety, physical sobriety is the most important thing in my life. Physical sobriety is the most important thing in my life because without physical sobriety it is absolutely impossible for me, my kind of an alcoholic, to say, thy will be done. <clears throat> many times, I've been drunk just as many times I've been sober. Many times I would sober up and I would try one more time until it come that point in my life when I lost absolute and total control and didn't care anymore. And I know what it's like to stand in the middle of my kitchen, look down the hallway, a little nine-year-old girl looking at me from the end of that hallway. She got her chin on her chest and her hair is in her face, and she didn't run down the hallway and grab me around the leg and say, Daddy, come play with me. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and without a shadow of a doubt, I knew exactly what she was thinking. She was wondering if what I was putting in me was going to work. There was no shame because my kind of an alcoholic will take you right through those emotions and put an umbrella of fear over you that controls you with intimidation. And there comes a point in time in my kind of an alcoholic drinking where the wives, the children, the dog, the cat, the neighbors, the cops, the people, the friends, and the enemies will only wonder one thing. When they see you drinking or using, they only wonder if it's going to work. Because if it don't work, God help you. God help you if you're in my way. Because the madness inside of me is demanding one thing. It's demanding one thing and one thing only. Just a moment of relief. I had long passed those points where a drink or a fix would keep me in that euphoria of grandiose happiness for any length of time. I craved a moment of relief. And standing in that kitchen early, early in the morning, taking a drink out of that little bottle, sucking on that thing, trying to get well enough to move on. My daughter looked at me, and she didn't say, Daddy, what are you doing? Please play with me, or don't beat me and Mommy anymore. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, this thing's got me. I don't have it. And I'd take a drink out of that bottle because I had no choice. It's like breathing. I had to have a drink out of that bottle. And I'd turn back around and that little girl was be gone because the only thing she's trying to figure out is which direction I was going so she'd go the other way. Or many, many times. Standing in my bathroom in the last part of that unbelievable madness. Standing in my bathroom, I'm cooking that stuff up and I'm getting ready to do my deal and I turn around and I look in the mirror and just for a second I caught a, a glimpse of a little ten and a half year old girl looking through the hole in the door in that bathroom where I probably stuck my foot one day and just enough where she could get eye level and she's looking at me through the hole in the door in that bathroom, and I look at her in that reflection of that mirror, and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt there's a madness screaming inside of me that said, God, I don't want to live this way. you got to do something. you got to take this away. you got to remove this from me. Don't you understand? I don't want to be this way. Can't you feel the feeling inside of me? And it didn't take more than a fraction of a second for me to have that thought. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and she didn't say, Daddy, what are you doing? She'd seen me doing those things many times. She wasn't ashamed of what I was doing. All she wanted to know was what I was doing so she could go the way that I was going in the opposite direction. And depending upon whether what I was putting in me, that made a decision for her where she went what she did. She lived totally and completely under the umbrella of that kind of insanity, that kind of feeling. There is a place where we can go if we flourish in this disease. Some place beyond hate, a gray zone place where we can go and live where there are no feelings, where there is no hope, where there is no trust. It's just existence without the slightest thought that you have a choice. And I know what it's like early, early in the afternoon wanting a drink, needing a drink, got to have a drink. The only thing that I could think about was needing that drink. Physically, I had to have that drink. I had only one choice, 
and a big time Charlie like me crawled out of the back of that house. On my hands and my knees, and the only money in that house was in my daughter's piggy bank, a little raggedy end piggy bank. I crawled down the hallway. I went in her bedroom, and I reached under her bed, and I drug a piggy bank out, and I broke it in the middle of her floor. It was full of the change that I'd given her whenever I sobered up long enough to have the guilt, and it was easier to give her the money than to explain why or why not. And being the big-time Charlie like me, a big-time wheeler dealer, I break that piggy bank, and I'm separating the pennies, nickels, dimes, and the quarters because I ain't going down to the liquor store or the Connections house with no pennies. I'm going to be showing silver all the way. You bet. The alcoholic ego is an unbelievable thing. And I'm on my hands and my knees stealing my own kid's money, and I don't know about your kind of an alcoholic, but my kind of alcoholic has eyes in the back of my head when I'm at my worst. We know those feelings. Being the very best father I could be that day, I glanced over my shoulder and my daughter, my little 10, 10 and a half year old daughter was hiding in the closet behind me that day. She didn't go to school that day because she had a black eye and a busted lip. She didn't go to school that day because she was ashamed of the way she looked. We'd done move past that. She stayed home that day because if she'd have gone to school that day looking like that, the cops would have come and got daddy one more time. And that ain't too bad because when I'm locked up, it gives the family a rest. But they knew, and they knew I knew, that if you put me away, I'm going to get out. And when I get out, I'm coming home, and God help you if you do that to me one more time. So it was just easier for that little girl to hide in the closet that day. And being the big, very, very big deal that I was, on my hands and my knees, stealing that little girl's money, I give her a break. Can you imagine that? Big time Charlie like me, I give that kid a break. I let her shoot out behind me without inflicting any more pain in her life. Because you see, at that point in my life, my kind of an alcoholic, if you catch me at my worst, it is absolutely, absolutely necessary for me to inflict some kind of pain on your life that will overshadow the memory of what you saw me at my worst. It's a bet. And being the very best father I could be, give that kid a break. I'll let her shoot out behind me without inflicting any more pain. And we lived that way not a day or a week or a month. We lived that way for some years. It become a way of life. It became a lifestyle. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this way of life, this program way of life, has to be a miracle. The miracle is not me or any of the other speakers or even you. The miracle is the program. The miracle is the program. And if you can sit in this room this morning and you can imagine, as I'm sure you do because I can feel the feelings and I can hear the silence, if you can imagine what it would be like to be that little girl in that closet, maybe some of you are, were, maybe some of you are going there. If you can imagine that, then don't cheat yourself out of this. I beg of you, don't cheat yourself out of this. If there's an expect a miracle, then expect this. It's true. It is an absolute truism. It is absolutely possible to go from that closet to where I stand today and where that little girl is today. It is absolutely possible, if you can imagine the pain and the terror and the bewilderment and the unbelievable hopelessness, then don't you cheat yourself out of this. Don't sit here this morning and judge this deal. And cheat yourself out of this. There is a principle, which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument which will not fail, cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is contempt prior to investigation. And that's the way I lived. That's the way I lived. So if you sit here this morning and you feel what we have here, you've got to feel safe. You've got to feel safe in the confines of this spiritual feeling this morning. And the greatest example that I can tell you of that is this day, right now, this moment, this heartbeat, that little girl that was in that closet lives in Milan, Italy. She's a beautiful young lady. She's 30 years old. She loves her daddy, and she's forgiven her daddy. She has forgiven me for the things that I have done, and I have forgiven me for the things that went on because I've accepted this disease of alcoholism and how it controlled my life, and so has she. She's an international model. Now, that ain't a big deal. But I'm going to tell you the miracle of all miracles is the fact that there's a God in her life too. And it's a long, long way 
from the back of that closet with a black eye and a busted lip to the ramp to the Paris Fashion Show. It's a long, long way, baby, for that kid to come out of there and be there. And there. And you see, that's an example of what this program is, a chapter of the family afterwards. A chapter of the family afterwards. And I am eternally grateful for that. You know, there was a time in that little girl's life, and this is a disease, and I share this for one reason only. There was a time in that little girl's life that in my worst drinking, the only friend she could bring home, she brought home a little stray dog. And it looked like her. She had hair in her face, and she was all... Twisted up, she wore an old coat of many colors, and she'd put a hard-boiled egg in a pocket, and it slid down in the lining, and she'd sit on it, and she'd look and smell like she'd look and smell. And she brought a little cocker spaniel dog all matted and full of cuckleberries, and she brought that dog home. And I come out of a 10-day blackout, a long run on crystal meth and Jack Daniels, and I had a nine-shot twenty-two pistol laying on my chest. And I come out of a blackout, and the rage and jealousy inside of me was so great. And I looked across the room, and my daughter's laying over there with that dog on her chest and the dog's licking her in the face. And I I demanded the love that I couldn't have because of the way I was. And I stood up off that couch and I said, you can't love something more than you love me. And I shot that dog nine times. The last time I shot that dog, we backed it into the corner and shot it in the eye. And my daughter never moved. Six inches from her head, I killed that dog. And her mother standing in the kitchen, not five feet away, never moved. And there wasn't a sound. There wasn't a tear. There was no emotion. My daughter hated me for that, and rightfully so. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had to recognize that we steal souls. We steal souls, the greatest theft of all. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and six years after being in this program, my daughter being in the program of Alateen, forced her to go to Alateen, she had to make the transition from Alateen into Al-Anon, and she had to do another inventory. And it came a time whenever it was time for her to do that, and Simone and I were asked to speak at a father-daughter banquet and for Alateens, and she'd made this fourth step, and she hadn't done her fifth, and I went to her and I said, baby, we got to go Saturday and do this uh, father-daughter banquet thing, and I said, I know you've got a fourth step and you're sitting on it. You're six years in the program, and I know you're sitting on a fourth step again. I said, I'm going to tell you something, I'm not going to go with you until you do your fifth step, and she got mad at me, and she said, you can't tell me when I'm supposed to do my fifth step. And I said, I'm not telling you when you got to do it. What I'm telling you is I'm not going to sit in that audience and let you do your fifth step from this podium. That is not what the podium is for. It's not fair to me, nor is it fair to the kids that are going to be there. And I'm not going to listen to it. So if you don't do your fifth step, I'm not going with you. And she got mad, and but she got her sponsor, and she went and did her fifth step. And she came home, and she told me, Daddy, said, you remember the time you killed the dog? And I said, yeah. I said, I hated you for that. I couldn't understand. I've come to understand that you did that, you love animals, and you've always shown love and compassion, but that was the insanity of where you were coming from. But she said, the stumbling block in my own inventory was the fact that I used to take my cat and put my cat in the dryer, and I turned the dryer on and spin that dryer. And after a few seconds, the revolution's there, I would open the door, and the cat would jump out and cling to me. She said, Daddy, I'm six years in this program, and I'm running around looking for a relationship like that some clinging, sick need to have that, the need. And we think we only hurt ourselves. You see, I am so grateful for this program and the steps and the love of God because that was the beginning, not only for me, from that little girl. That little girl come from that closet to where she is today because of a love of God and because of life that she's found in these rooms with people like you. And I'm eternally grateful for that because she lives a beautiful life. She has a good relationship. She's a whole woman. And she's been able to enjoy life and be free and set me free. And I've learned that it is in forgiving that we are forgiven. And I understood those things little by little. When I was new sober, I had to start making amends. And I owed a lot of things. And the amends are the things that we talk about here. We heard it in the promises. Come for those things. And there's many amends that I could not make <clears throat> until I had the feeling of what it felt like to be lied to, cheated, robbed, and uh, betrayed. Sober, I had to have those experiences in my life before I could honestly sit down and make my amends list. Because I drank so much that I didn't know the difference between 
true and false, right and wrong, even when I sobered up. There are some values, some values, and I love the people here at this conference, especially because the values are very strong here. We learn to live with each other and accept each other in this program. But there's four absolutes, four absolutes that were absolutely necessary for me to stay sober. I had to quit drinking, I had to quit using, I had to quit beating on those people, no physical violence, and I had to learn to be faithful. I have not beat that lady or that kid in over 17 years, nor have I cheated on my wife in over 17 years. And what that put into that relationship, you bet. You bet. What that put into that relationship is trust. Trust, something I knew nothing about. The curse of a thief is he doesn't trust himself. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was willing to do anything. I owed some people some money. I owed some people some things. I had st stolen some things. I was holding on some stuff. And I found out a very important thing, one of the most spiritual experiences that I've experienced from the very beginning of my sobriety happened to me when I was 54 days sober. I've been mewing a little dope, just a little light deal, earn a little side money. I wasn't an addict. I'm a, everybody around, I'm an, I'm an alcoholic and a dope fiend. I'm an alcoholic and a dope dealer. <laughs> and I had a little package I forgot to deliver. Business needed to be taken care of right away. My sponsor didn't offer to go with me. <laughs> he allowed me the privilege of taking care of some of that stuff by myself. And Sue has always allowed me the privilege of making my amends without causing her any handicap. And I had to go get this stuff and meet these people and take it back. 54 days sober, I met them, and I carried that package across the parking lot up in Ventura County, northern midway of California coast. And I walked over and gave these people their stuff, and I, I told them, I said, uh, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't care if they knew what it was. It didn't make any difference, whatever. I said, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and here's your stuff. They said, don't call me, I'll call you. And I turned around and I walked back to my car. I made that long walk, 54 days sober, across that parking lot. And I found out a very spiritual value, a very spiritual experience. Spirituality and love for me is an action, an action. And I walked through that wall of fear, and I've come to understand, I've come to understand that every good thing in my life is preceded by a wall of fear. Every good thing in my life you must walk through the wall of fear first. My God, how many great things I cheated myself out of because of silly, intimidating fears. And that morning I walked across that parking lot and I gave that deal back to them. And I figured when I turn my back on them, they're going to blow a hole in me the size of a watermelon. And I made that long walk back to my car and I got in that car and I drove 60, 70 miles back down the coast and went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt there's some power, power greater than me was taking care of me. And I walked through many walls of fear, many walls of fear. Three, three and a half years sober, Sue and I lived in that house. We sobered up in that house. didn't have a door jam in it. It wasn't busted wide open. There was windows busted out of the house, painted two or three different colors. It's a weird old house. And we stayed in that house just like that. Stayed in that house uh, for three and a half years. It never fixed it up for three and a half years of my sobriety. We stayed in that house because at any given time I could look around that house and see who I was, where I'd been, and where I came from. It was necessary for me. And uh, after three and a half years of sobriety, we had an opportunity, a real consequence, I guess, little miracles of God that seemed to be consequences to get out of that house and get another house. And I bought that house for $12,000, lived in it for 12 years. Sue lived in it, and I was gone most of the time. She made most of the payments. Bought it for twelve thousand dollars. Lived in it twelve years and owed eighty. <laughs> <laughs> owed eighty thousand. I owed sixty on first, seconds, and thirds, and another twenty on fourth, fifth, and sixth. And of the twelve, I put ten down, and I still owed about two of the twenty-five hundred that I started out with. You know, <coughs> only alcoholic can do that. <laughs> but it kept me out of prison a lot of times, and. And I was able to sell that house, and soon I walked in. You know, one of the miracles of this program, we walked in to sign the papers on that thing. They told us that we were going to get a certain deal and all. I didn't understand all that stuff. Press hard, six copies, you know. And I looked at that deal, and, and uh, the real estate people had, had screwed that up, and they had the interest rate 
a flexible interest, and I knew that that interest was going to go sky high. I just knew it, felt it in my heart, and I told him, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll sign this piece of paper for this new house. I'm three and a half years sober. I'm scared to death, but I'm going to lose it. I know I'm going to lose it. You're making me buy something here. It isn't what you said you'd do, but I said I'd do it, and I'm going to follow the deal. And I signed that contract. The next day, the real estate person called us up and said they took that contract back to the lender and did something that has never happened before or since. They took a signed contract for a flexible interest and gave me what verbally they said they would give me initially at a much less interest rate fixed. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wanted me to have something and I didn't understand what. I knew that book said that nothing of any material value would come and stay prior to spiritual growth. And we bought this house and it had a swimming pool, had all those things and Many, many drunks, many, many times, Sue and I'd stand over there and look out the back door of that house, and all these drunks, man, there was whores, there was robbers, rapists, ever dingbat and alcoholics, and I would be standing around, and I'd think, my goodness, if my neighbors had any idea what was in my backyard. <laughs> and, uh, and yet they'd all get together and eat them hot dogs and sing happy birthday to some goof that didn't know what was going on. And, <clears throat> and you could walk in that house and it was a home and we lived in that house and we were able to enjoy those things and participate in that and uh, we've had many good things like that it is not necessary to be poor to be spiritual the book says some of us will never get back what we used to have never have that value to earn what we used to earn and yet some of us will get to enjoy many things and we have been able to enjoy many many things and do many things because it's always been with you it's always been for you. And I don't know how you can take somebody that's as selfish as we were and turn that around without some kind of a spiritual experience. And I know of no other way, really, to explain that spiritual experience other than by example. I'm a show-me type of guy, and I had absolutely no concept of this God. I used to sit in church. They used to take me down and baptize. I'd get them holy rolling deals, and down the aisle would go drunk, had a water, beach nut in my mouth, and they'd go in there and <laughs> take my clothes off take me in there and dump me in that tub and I'd about drown and they'd jerk me out and say, you're saved now and I'd say, I need a drink now and I'd have to sneak around and go get my fifth of hot vodka out from underneath the truck, take a drink, and go up and stand on the porch and, <laughs> and I mean, they just, they dang near drown me with all that stuff. But the thing I understand is sitting in that church that day, my wife sitting on one side of me, my daughter sitting on the other side of me and we're all praying that I don't drink we're all praying I don't drink, including me. And I'd walk right out of there and take a drink. And I know today that that robbed those people that love me of their belief in God. You see, it robbed them of their belief in God. I knew from a long time ago. I remember when I was a kid growing up up there in the panhandle, man, all them holy rolling Methodists and Baptists up there, man, they said, you do this, you think this, you're going to hell. And I volunteered. I wanted to be with my friend. I knew they were going. And uh, I volunteered to go, so I gave up on it. I didn't make a whole lot of difference to me. I would simulate along the way. Our good alkies can simulate. So when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought I was an atheist. And I was, I'm an atheist. Some guy got a dictionary and had me look up the definition of an atheist, and I didn't even understand it. And he said, you're saying you're something you don't even understand. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So they said, you gotta, you got to understand there is a God, and you're not him. <laughs> It really relieved me because it's a big burden. And so I went about trying to do whatever I was supposed to do. There's some things that I've done because they told me to do it. They told me to pray and meditate every morning because I'm a morning. I'm one of them kind of alcoholics that they say you used to drink till you'd think they'd pass out forever. And yet in the morning, whoo, they wake up and search madly for a drink. That's me. And when I sobered up, I did not lay in the bed and pontificate the residue. I went, bam, I'm up. And I'm on the deck and I'm gone. And I'd go down there and I'd say, God, you better take care of me because I'm going to be real busy. And I'd get my meditation books out and I'd read them. I couldn't remember nothing. they said. say it. Just like, watch, it won't work. And try to shake it. And try to remember that stuff. And I'd pray and meditate. And every time I meditated, I'd slip into a sexual fantasy. <laughs> Reading all this stuff every morning. I have read that deal. Every morning, and I get up at least 30, 45 minutes early so that I can get around and do my meditation in the morning. I've done that faithfully. There's certain things I've done faithfully. 
I've written in the margins what it was like when I was new. Well, I've gone through two or three books because 1988, having a bad day. 1989, having a good day. 1990, having a bad day. 1991, having a good day. Uh, my goodness, there's a little pattern here. <laughs> PMS. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, I just doing the drill, and I had absolutely no idea what in the world was going on. And I love the old timers that have the timing. Timing is very critical. And they have the timing because they got the experience, and they wait till you're sober long enough, you're just about to implode <laughs> from inside out. And you've done the steps, you've prayed, you're doing all the deal, you're standing around waiting for it to happen. There's nothing worse than waiting for it to happen than when it happens, because you're ready. And I was ready, and nothing was happening, because you can't give something away you don't have. And my sponsor, who had appointed himself to be my sponsor at that time, a guy by the name of Rotten Ron, and he had great timing for people like me. And he waited until I was just about ready to die. It's over. I just got out of the hospital because I was bleeding internally from hate and anticipation. And my drug of choice in sobriety is adrenaline. And I'm sober and I'm ready and nothing's happening. And uh, I mean, they had quit picking on me. I was that bad. A cop by the name of... Bob the cop gave me a grenade, and he said, the closest thing you're going to get to spirituality and Jesus Christ, our Savior, is to put this grenade in your mouth and pull the pin. <laughs> and I would hold that grenade and have this wild look in my eye and say, thank you. I love you very much. Keep coming back. And I wondered why nobody was coming up to talk to me much. And I was standing around a meeting, just radiating hate. And uh, I looked around at a weirdo standing next to me. Weirdest looking guy you ever seen. He wasn't short enough to be a midget or tall enough to be a man. Just weird. <laughs> My sponsor wouldn't stand anywhere near me. I had so many guns on me that I, if you'd have bumped into me, that have been a mushroom cloud. <laughs> and I was just absolutely stark raving sober. And I was standing there, and this guy said, Will you be my sponsor? <laughs> Jesus, I can't even take care of myself. How can I help you? <laughs> I was waiting for a doctor, a lawyer, maybe a parole officer to drop by and ask me to be their sponsor so I could take care of a little floating resentment or two. <laughs> this guy came along and said, will you be my sponsor? And I said, here, hold my grenade. <laughs> <laughs> I went over to my sponsor and I said, see that weirdo over there? And he said, yeah. I said, he just asked me to be his sponsor. And my sponsor said the dumbest thing. He said, yeah, I know. I sent him over there. <laughs> just in the nick of time. He said, you go over there and tell him you'll be his sponsor and do exactly what he said. That did not make sense to me then or now. But I know sponsors, they have that intuitive old-timer depth perception to know that when you're desperate enough, you'll do anything. And he waited till I was absolutely so desperate I was willing to do anything. And the guy that he sent me just looked weirdo. The guy had six years of sobriety and I had three. He couldn't read or write and he couldn't do the steps. And he was going nuts. And my sponsor sponsored him. He worked for my sponsor. And my sponsor told him that if he didn't come and ask me to be his sponsor, he was going to fire him. <laughs> so he had three more years than me, but he couldn't do the steps. He'd never done the steps. He'd never written them. And so he always told me, you're my sponsor, but I got more time than you. <laughs> and so he always umbrellaed that over me. And I said, but you're stupid. <laughs> he said, that'll make no difference. I didn't drink today. Yeah. Well, I went back and told him my sponsor said I had to be his sponsor. What do you want to do? And at that time, I had cleaned up. I was looking as though I was ready. I had prepared myself. I had one of them $59.99 CNR closure suits, pinstripe suit, vest, so when you get chilly on it, don't show up. Had that reversible tie and a hanky made me look like I was from New York. Yeah. Got my hair cut. I had my beard trimmed and... I had some of them shoes that you don't wear socks, <laughs> and I felt funny with that. And uh, I was standing there, I had a big AA car. You got to get a big AA car. Got a big Mark IV Lincoln. Man, the hood's way out there, man, so you can give the newcomers hope. Got to have a big AA car. 
said, how you doing? Look at my car. <laughs> hey, any car is one when you're new is, has less than 100,000 miles on it. See, and I got that big Lincoln. I got in my Lincoln. We took off, started going to meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous. And he'd say, you ever do anything like this? And then he'd whip off some of this stuff. And I'd say, you're sick. But I've done something worse than that. So I'd lie to him and tell him some big story about what I'd done. And he'd come back the next day and say, I know you lied to me about that. He said, it's physically impossible to do what you said you did. <laughs> Yeah, but I grew up on a farm. <laughs> that guy ended up. That guy ended up uh, coming over to my house. And got that new house. Got a new driveway. Didn't have that old blacktop driveway anymore. Got a new concrete driveway. That's spiritual. No oil marks on it. And I went over there and knocked to the door, and there he was. Had his old car parked in my driveway, running six quarts of oil down my new concrete. <laughs> And he had his big book in his hand, and he was wandering around in there, and he said, I want to work the steps like you did, and I try to remember how I did them, and I said, well, get in quick, because I, I, I don't want the neighbors to see you. <laughs> I, said, I know I'm powerless, because you're in my house, and know my life's unmanageable, because it looks like you're going to be here a while. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm crazy, because I understand you, and you understand me, so we must be on step three. We've got to get on our knees and pray and do this deal in the book. And so I got on my knees and got down next to him, and he cuddled underneath my arm, you know, and the cat walked by and looked at us weird. <laughs> so I had that little tingling sensation, and I thought, oh, geez. And uh, we read the third step prayer, and, and uh, then he jumped up and said, I want to work my fourth step. And I, oh, well, he said, I, I can't write. And he pulled these papers out, and I, oh. And I did one of them quick prayers. What are we going to do? And he said, I'll talk. You write. So he started talking, and I started writing. And he said, you ever do anything like that? And I started telling him some of my stuff. And he said, man, you're sick. <laughs> and he talked some more stuff, and I'd tell him some of my stuff. A couple of things came up that I'd forgotten to tell my sponsor. You know, more will be revealed. And I knew God was in the room, and this dingling couldn't read, so I just put some of my crap in his. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Yeah. God don't care, and we burn it. <laughs> he ran around, kissed me on the cheek, and said, I love you. And I figured, well, that's it. Divorce her and follow him. I don't know. Everybody's hugging around here anyway. And uh, Yet I know something. That's the very first time in my entire life, the very, very first time in my entire life, that I ever spent any length of time thinking about anybody else but myself. And I know my sponsor knew that that's the only way I was ever going to get the deal. I had to get so desperate that I was willing to listen to you rather than to me. The greatest act of love, the greatest act of love is the act of listening. The act of listening. You see, when you do your fifth step with your sponsor, it's half the deal. When you receive one, it completes the circle. When you sit there and you listen to another human being, makes full circle. And that day is the first time in my entire life that I sit there and I listen to another human being. I didn't judge them for what they were or what they'd done. I loved them more for having the strength and the willingness to tell their deepest, darkest secrets. And I know today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I'm as sober as I am secret. I have absolutely no secrets in my life. There's nothing going on in my life today that I can't stand here and let you see. You know, if you have no secrets, there is no gossip. There is no gossip if you have no secrets. You see, and I have no secrets, so there can be no gossip. And what that does, that sets me free. Freedom of bondage of self. And the freedom that I've come to understand today is the freedom that I'm known by helping you. By helping you and being part of you, you allowed me to be what I always wanted to be. You allowed me to be me. I wandered around out there wondering what I was or where I was going. I ran with all the people, I had all the kinds of facades, and I had all the kinds of excuses, and I had all the kinds of costumes to be everything I wanted to be. I could have posed for a family portrait by myself, and I didn't even know who I was. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, little by little, you stripped those costumes away from me by allowing me to sit with you. And the second greatest act of love is the act of transparency. When I let you see in, I could see out. And little by little, I became the sea. 
I could see you and I could see your face. I could see the smile. I could hear your laughter. Laughter is the greatest healing medicine of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a very simple reason. Because the door of the sick mind opens from the inside. There is no key on the outside, no door knob. And when we sit in these rooms and we laugh, we laugh. The door opens just a little bit. It opens just a little bit. And what that does, it gives us a moment where we can stick the answer in. And when you come here and you laugh, you open that door just a little bit. Put it in. Sneaks up on you. Then you wonder when you go home, what was it? What was it? I heard something. Felt something. You come here and you feel safe. You feel the love we have. And you enjoy the being. You know, I'm a show-me type of guy. And I listen and I like the examples. And I hear your stories and I laugh and I feel the feelings and I feel the hope. And I've developed the trust. And I've shared that with you. What greater example than to have the man that saw me when I was new and has known me. What greater example of this program than I make the friends that we've made here. What greater example than to be with my wife 34 years later. What greater example than to show you my family. To be with my father. Father and son. He's just my dad. That's all I ever wanted him to be. Just my dad. To share with you that my daughter has come back to our life and lives with us with the love and the caring and the forgiveness that we've grown to know as part of life. And yet, you know, I look back on my life and I know one, one most simple way to explain it, I suppose, by explaining a story. There was a story of a great actor, a great actor, very famous actor, and he was given an opportunity to play a part in a spiritual play. And in that spiritual play, it was going to be a big production type of thing, and the closing part of that play was the 23rd Psalm. Not being a student of the Bible, he went to the source. He had a brother who was a great minister. Great minister. And so he thought, well, I'll go see my brother, and come Sunday, he went over to the church and he went in to see his brother just sat in the congregation not anything special and lo and behold that morning the sermon was on the 23rd psalm and when the actor's brother delivered the sermon why the people felt safe there was an awe in that room a calmness and they felt the feelings and the love and the actor he simulated that and he thought well you know i want to try to do it that way so he went back and he practiced this play and he did his part and he practiced in front of the mirror, and he prepared himself. He was ready from the day of the play. And when it came the part for the 23rd Psalm, the closing part, the great actor did his best. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me to green pastures, I lay down, and I, I drink the soul of the water, and I, my cup runneth over, my soul is restored. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he prepares me in front of my enemies. Gladness and mercy follow me throughout my life because I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And the people in that place stood up and gave the actor standing ovation. Standing ovation when he recited that. And the great actor walked over behind the stage and he brought his brother out. And he said, I want you people to witness something. And that evening, the minister, the great minister, recited the 30, 23rd Psalm. Totally and completely different reaction. Totally. The audience sat still. They were calm. Total, complete reaction. And the great actor came over and stood beside his brother. He said, there's a great difference here. A very simple difference, but a great difference. The difference is, I'm the actor, I only knew the sheep. My brother, the minister, knew the shepherd. You see, I'm so blessed. Because I have stayed here long enough to not only know the sheep, but to know the shepherd. God bless and thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.